Oh, thank you very much. No problem. Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. Feel free to go. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about what's happening with antibiotic use in, in our pets. Um, and I have a little sidetracked about chickens, um, so be prepared for that. Um, and I also want to talk specifically about how pet owners can contribute to the responsible use of antimicrobials. First of all, why does this even matter? Um, well, I think many of you in the room will have pets. 70% of Australian households have a pet. Um, there are more than 6 million dogs and more than 5 million owned cats in Australia. Um, and and antibiotics are necessary, just like they are necessary in children, to maintain health and welfare. And um, we want antibiotics to keep working for as long as possible, not just for humans, but also for animals. Um, and we know that antibiotic use, whether justified or unjustified, amplifies and accelerates the development of AMR, which is antimicrobial resistance. Um, so why does this even matter again? Um, the human-animal bond is a really important thing. Um, Sometimes people worry about this kind of activity on the left. <laughs> um, I can say that happens in my household. I'm not worried about it. Nobody in my family has any immunocompromise. Um, so I'm, I'm not concerned about that behaviour. Um, but I would say that, you know, maybe um, in other situations, you may want to be a little bit more careful about that. 40% um, of people sleep with their pets. My dogs sleep with my daughter. Uh, no matter how hard I try to stop that for her own sleep quality, she refuses. So she has two dogs dogs in the bed with her every night. Um, and one thing that we know about bacteria compared to viruses is, is they're not really fussy. They will move freely between you and your pets and in both directions, um, whereas viruses and some other uh, microbes are a little bit more fastidious about what they do. Um, and it's worth noting that a lot of the antibiotics that we're using in you are the same antibiotics that we're using in pets. Augmentin is we call it Clavulox or various other trade names. Um, doxycycline is Vibrovet, comes in a fishy paste uh, for cats. So I'd love a bit of audience participation here. Um, out of these two individuals, who thinks that the, pers the person is more likely to harbour antibiotic resistant bacteria? Okay, a few people. And who thinks that the filthy dog on the right is more likely to harbour antibiotic resistant bacteria. Okay, interesting. Not that many people voting, <laughs> but um, a few people thought it might be the person. Um, and actually, I, I would say both of them are going to harbour antibiotic resistant bacteria. We're finding antibiotic resistant bacteria in seabirds that have never come into contact with humans ever, never, certainly never received a course of antimicrobials. Um, however, I would say that the dog is less likely to harbour problematic antibiotic resistant bacteria. And why is that the case? Well, we know from some, some work that we've done at the Melbourne Veterinary School that antibiotic are given to people at a rate of more than twice of what is happening in their pets. So per life year, you as a person are more likely to receive antibiotic, twice as likely to receive a course of antibiotics as your animal is, which kind of flies in the face of, I think, some impressions that people have of what's happening in, vet, in the veterinary practice. Um, so we have lower overall use of systemic antibiotics in animals. Um, we have low use of a drug class called fluoroquinolones. Um, vets seem to have really taken on the message that we shouldn't be using these drugs um, unless we're in a really special situation um, because they tend to drive antibiotic resistance quite quickly. Um, so vets are doing a great job on that front. Um, there is one drug that is still a problem, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, with, there's almost no use of those last resort antibiotics that you might end up having if you ended up in ICU. Um, and there's lower levels of antibiotic resistance in animal pathogens, generally speaking. So for example, I've done a big study on cystitis in dogs and cats, and pretty much all cystitis in dogs and cats responds beautifully to amoxicillin on its own. The same can't be said of amoxicillin in UTIs in women, um, because there's just much higher levels of resistance to that drug. So I'm just gonna go on a little sidetrack here because sometimes when I speak to people 
consumers to, to doctors, they when and I say, oh, I'm doing an antibiotic, I'm doing a PhD on antibiotic stewardship, they're like, oh, I hope you're sorting out the chickens. And I, I always find that a bit funny because we don't actually use antibiotics very much in chicken production in Australia. It's one of those bizarre myths that just refuses to go away. So I want to give everyone a little bit of relief about the, the antibiotic problems in chickens. We really don't have one. They, um, they're really huge in chicken farms on biosecurity. They're huge on vaccines. And it actually costs quite a lot of money to give thousands of chickens antibiotics, so they try not to do that. Um, let's take a breath. Um, when they use antibiotics in chickens, it's mostly low importance antibiotics. Um, and we don't use antibiotics for growth promotion. Despite what you might read in the media, this has not been a thing in Australia. Um, actually, if you are worried about antibiotic residues in chicken products, including eggs, the problem area is probably going to be the backyard chook that your neighbour has, <laughs> that they've treated with antibiotics and they give you some eggs across the fence. That is where you are going to find antibiotic residues and potentially more antibiotic resistance. So if you're currently paying a premium for a product that's labelled, uh, a chicken product that's labelled antibiotic free, I just want to tell you you're being ripped off um, <laughs> because pretty much all commercial chicken meat is antibiotic free. Um, it's also hormone free. We've never used hormones in chicken production. Uh, that's another myth. So um, just buy the normal chicken, guys. <laughs> um, one thing that's been really interesting is that there is this increasing consumer demand for antibiotic free production, as in the animals shouldn't receive antibiotics throughout their life cycle. Um, and I find that a problematic um, area because actually what is happening with those animals is they are getting, they're still getting sick. They do it's from time to time, no matter how much care we take, some animals will get sick. Um, and what happens if you have signed up to an antibiotic free production system is the sick animals don't get treatment. That's not what we want. We want sick animals and sick people to get proper antibiotic therapy. So I would su suggest that we don't push for antibiotic free production. We should push for responsible antibiotic use, appropriate use. So now I'm going back to pets. Um, I've done some work with pet owners and also with companion animal vets. Um, and I did this survey with pet owners to find out what they think about um, antibiotics, what do they expect, um, what do they know, what do they feel about antibiotics, and also what do they want their vets to say to them in the clinic when they decline or delay antibiotics, or when they're trying to persuade you as a cat owner to give your cat tablets or some other oral type of antibiotic instead of giving this drug. This is a problem area. This is convenia. It's a third generation Kephlosporin. It's one of our most important antibiotic classes. Um, it really encourages the development of some pretty nasty um, ex extended spectrum beta lactamases in particular. And the reason why vets and clients sometimes use it is because it's basically a course of antibiotics in one injection. It lasts for 14 days, effective dose, and then it tails off for another mm, three weeks or so at a subtherapeutic dose that I just don't even wanna think about. And basically it's, it's not a good fit for most of the typical infections that we see anyway. It's not the best choice of drug. Um, so sometimes vets who are trying to do the right thing, try to convince pet owners to give their animal tablets. Sometimes pet owners don't wanna do that. Um, and I, I understand it is hard with some cats. Um, so just on the expectations, about a quarter of the pet owners that I surveyed had expected to receive antibiotics when they presented with a sick animal, specifically expected antibiotics, and 15% of them had actually said to vet, give me antibiotics. Um, so it's, it's not a myth that people are asking for antibiotics out there. Um, with regard to the knowledge and opinions, I, they, I ask these questions, sorry, it's not that clear, but um, the pink bars basically show the proportion of people who disagreed with the statement and the blue show the people who agreed and the strength of that agreement and the, the beige is the neutral. Um, and what I found was that there was some confusion 
about what happens with bacteria between animals and people, um, there was not much appreciation that bacteria can move between those two. Um, but it was interesting to note that actually a lot of the people who answered this survey were doctors. And I, that happened because a, a friend of mine was on Medical Mums and shared it. So I had a bunch of um, female doctors answering this survey and still not many of them thought that uh, bacteria transferred from pets to their owners and from owners to their pets. So I think we need to work a bit on that. So a lot of the reason I did this survey was with pet owners was to find out what vets should be doing when they want to do responsible prescribing in the clinic. Um, I wanted to, so what I found was quite reassuring that although a lot of owners might want antibiotics, they're not actually that often upset when they are declined. 97% um, of people acknowledge that vets should really only give them when antibiotics are absolutely needed. And 72% believe that superbugs um, are a serious problem in Australia. Um, the other two thirds understood that antibiotics ca carry some significant risks, um, but half of them thought that the risks were confined to that treated animal. And I think that speaks a little bit to what Mark was saying earlier. Um, and just under 40% knew that bacteria transferred from pets to owners, but even fewer knew that it went the other way around. We had this idea that we are clean and our animals are dirty. It's not really the case. <laughs> um, so this is more about, I normally tell vets about this, you know, you need to tell clients about what's what's reassuring about the, um, the animal's presentation um, and talk about direct adverse effects and AMR risk to the pet, um, but also focus on the effectiveness of treatment. So where convenia, for example, is not the most effective treatment, owners should hear that so that they can come on board with the idea of giving their cat some tablets. Um, reassuringly, most people trust their vet and trust that their vet has their animal's best interests at heart. So I, after the survey, I decided to do some interviews with pet owners and with vets who treat pets. Um, I did over 50 hours of interviews and a lot of painstaking um, transcription and um, thematic analysis. And I, I deliberately selected people to interview who I thought would represent the most diverse range of views that I could find. Um, and it was really interesting. So first to the pet owners, um, as I've said, they see the vets as trusted experts who, ha who have their animal's best interest at heart. This person said, I have a lot of trust and faith that our vet genuinely cares for animals, doesn't want to rush into giving them too many antibiotics over the course of their life. This person was a little bit contrasting. I was probably a bit pissed off that my dog didn't get medication. I really wanted something to fix it. You just think that you're going to get something. It's a shame. Doctors sometimes say, I'll give you a script in case you need it, but vets say you'll have to come back. So you sort of think, I'm going to have to pay for another consultation. Is this a money-making thing? It's not a money-making thing. <laughs> um, the owner's priority even uh, is that they would like their animal's suffering to be relieved as soon as possible. And I think that would be true where, where parents are coming in with children suffering for, from sore ears or, or whatever it is. If people believe that antibiotics are the way to relieve that suffering as soon as possible, that's what they want. Um, and we need to find ways to address that. Um, we need to address the pain when a child has an ear infection. Um, we need to address the other symptoms when a dog has an infection that's causing them to suffer. Um, you don't ever want to see your pet suffer. If giving them an antibiotic would be an easier way to fix that quickly and less stressfully for them, that's what I want to see. Um, the speed of recovery is important for me. I don't want to see my dog uncomfortable or stressed. So you can hear that the owners are really invested. We really love and care for our animals and we do not want them to suffer unnecessarily. So if antibiotics are not going to make them get better faster because they've got a viral infection, we need to clarify that with our owners and say, I can give you antibiotics. It won't make any difference to the speed of recovery. So similar to what Mark was saying, there were some major gaps in the uh, pet owner's understanding of antibiotic resistance. Um, you've got a cold and the GP gives you antibiotics and when you actually need them, your immune system is kind of already adjusted for antibiotics. Someone said, I would assume antibiotic resistance is the same as when you get a vaccine, your body builds up a tolerance to whatever you're being injected with. And I always got told resistance happens if you don't finish 
the course if you don't finish them and if they're over prescribed I don't know whether a new bacteria forms that the antibiotic doesn't work on or it just gets stronger and the antibiotic doesn't work so I think there's a little bit of work to do there um, so when I asked pet uh, sorry vets um, about why they sometimes give antibiotics when they don't think that antibiotics are going to help. Um, that was a really that was really interesting. Um, there were two main fears that they had. Um, one of them was that your animal is going to get much sicker and potentially die and suffer along the way, and that the vet will feel all sorts of guilt and regret about that. Obviously, the other fear is that they'll fail to meet your expectations as an animal owner, and that has some important downstream effects. If you're a dissatisfied client, you can take all sorts of um, paths. You may decide to have a confrontation with, with the vet or with, with the receptionist at the clinic. Vets are really nervous about protecting their staff from those uncomfortable um, situations. Um, we've, I had vets say, you know, I got slaughtered on social media when I refused to give antibiotics. Um, I, I've been reported to the vet board when I didn't give antibiotics to someone who wanted them. And that's a really, really stressful process for a health practitioner. Um, sometimes vets feel it's futile to say no because you're just going to go down to the clinic down the road and get them from another vet. Um, sometimes they're nervous about, the, you know, the, the business, the loss of reputation, um, financial con consequences. Maybe their colleagues will be frustrated for them because they would they should have just given the antibiotics in the first place and not upset the owner. Um, and they might get professional reprimand from the board if, if they're found to be negligent. And these things are compounded by some other factors, which are mostly outside of the vet's control. Things like clients explicitly asking for antibiotics, um, clients who um, are vets who are running out of time. They've got a waiting room full of 20 people. Um, they don't have the communication strategies to talk to clients about why they shouldn't be giving antibiotics. But I won't go into too much detail. I, um, so some of the pet owner behaviours are not helping um, too much to get optimal treatment for animals. Um, one, one thing that came through quite strongly was that pet owners often have this expectation of a quick fix, that it's a one visit, my sick pet is sick, I will come in one time and it will be fixed. Um, so that drives unnecessary use of antibiotics. Um, so this, this vet said part of the decision is client expectation. If you give a client a week of antibiotics and the dog needed two weeks, they'll be annoyed about having to come back, pay a recheck fee, uh, pay for more antibiotics. They say things like, I just want this sorted and I don't want to have to keep coming back. Then I'm going to be more inclined to give them a course of antibiotics that I'm fairly confident is going to get on top of that infection. So they, they're giving excessive duration of therapy because they're protecting themselves from the owner who's saying, I'm not, I don't want to come back. Um, asking for antibiotics often will lead to you getting antibiotics, especially if you think that that's what you really need and you are, I guess, expressing frustration with the vet not giving them to you. I didn't think the cat needed any antibiotics. The owner was still like, no, my wife says he has to have some antibiotics. And I said, all right, I'll give you some Clavulox. Um, and he's like, no, 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 it has to be an injectable antibiotic or she'll be very angry with me. Um, People say, I've had this antibiotic before, I want it again. And so my colleagues were like, just give it again, because otherwise it might come to come back to bite you in the butt. Um, so poor antibiotic selection, wrong antibiotic, and probably the cat didn't need antibiotics anyway. Um, confrontational behaviour will also lead to um, unnecessary antibiotics, vets are really scared that you are going to scream at them. They get abused on a daily basis. Um, they often get accused of money-making, fleecing people. It's, it's a problem throughout the vet profession. And um, as a result, we have extremely poor mental health and extremely high suicide rates. So they're really keen to avoid any confrontations that they can. God, if I don't give them what they want, they're going to scream at me. They'll, or they'll scream at someone in the clinic. So yeah, this other person said, in the case of a difficult client that you've had trouble with, 
There's a touch of worry that they're going to come back and they're going to be pissed off and all that sort of thing. So let's make absolutely sure. And that, that leads to an excessive duration of therapy. I'm going to wipe out any pathogens they might have by giving them four weeks of antibiotics when maybe they only needed one week. Um, Client disengagement was another interesting one. Um, if the client is afraid of handling their cat or if they're busy or if they seem like they're not going to remember the tablets, um, they're too blasé or whatever, then my feeling would be I'm going to give Convenia that injection and at least he has that in his system. So that's a defensive strategy. I would like to give you tablets. I don't believe that you are going to give the tablets so I'm going to give you this less appropriate injection instead. Um, so that's that's not great. I mean, I, I don't want to be too negative here. So I'm going to move on to what pet owners can do to help, um, to help their animals to get the best possible um, treatment and um, the best outcomes. I guess, firstly, don't demand antibiotics. I don't know that there are many people in this room who would do that, but there are people out there in the community who do it on a daily basis. Um, vets are already concerned about your animal's welfare, very concerned. And if they think antibiotics are going to help, they're going to suggest that you don't have to say, I want them. And I think this, this one is really important. Understanding, and I think after the talks we're having today, we all understand that antibiotics are not a harmless thing to give just in case. They're not a thing to give in instead of doing diagnostics and they're not a thing to do instead of doing good nursing or addressing underlying disease. And I point that one out because one of the issues we have with resistance in companion animal practice is ear otitis externa in dogs. Out, the skin of the outer ear becomes severely inflamed then you get this cycle of infection. But actually the cause of most of these cases is an underlying allergy. They're allergic to something in the, the environment. It can be their food, it can be pollens, it can be all sorts of things. If you don't address the allergy, you can treat the secondary bacterial infection with loads and loads of fun antibiotics, um, but it doesn't actually make the problem go away. So if owners say, I don't want to investigate this allergy, I don't want to treat the allergy, then they just end up in a cycle um, and it drives resistance and it drives unhappiness for the dog and for the owner. Remember that the most convenient antibiotic to give is often not the best choice. And this links into being willing to put in a little nursing effort at home Cats are sometimes a bit challenging to tablet. I think if anyone here has a cat, they might have experienced that. There are ways you can tackle that issue. Um, there are cool YouTube videos on how to tablet cats, how to make a cat burrito with a towel. There are things you can do to make it possible to give oral antibiotics to a cat. Um, and if you're in doubt, you can always ask the nurses at the vet clinic. They are great at getting oral medications into your cat and helping you out with that. And I guess also appreciate that not every ailment is going to be solved by one vet visit. Um, I think being prepared to come back if needed is a really good thing to do. And that's all I had to say. Thanks so much, Ree. Uh, so then for our final presentation today, um, and then we'll go on to our panel is Dr. Olivia. Uh, Olivia is an infectious diseases doctor uh, who works here at Peter Mac. And as part of uh, their PhD, they have been studying the gut microbiome. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a cook's tour through the gut microbiome. I should preface this by saying Monty Python style now for something completely different. Um, my background is obviously I'm an infectious diseases physician and I'm interested in patients with cancer or who are immune compromised. And I'm doing a PhD concurrently trying to understand how the gut microbiome interacts with patients during their cancer journey or transplantation journey. 
in my day-to-day clinical practice, I get asked all the time about the microbiome. um, And I think that speaks to our general understanding about how important our gut bugs are, whether that's in relation to antibiotics, like we're talking about today, or whether someone should be taking a probiotic or whether they should be introducing food into their diet that may be fermented, that may contribute to a healthier gut microbiome. I think we should all collectively be really excited about what the microbiome represents to us as a new way of offering diagnostic tests to perhaps predict who may develop cancer or how you may respond to cancer treatment, and also a potential opportunity to target new treatments through the microbiome. So the role of fecal transplants, probiotics, you know, oral consortiums of bugs in a bottle that you can take, they're definitely on the horizon. But hopefully I'm going to take you through today why I think we're maybe not just there yet and and what we really can say about gut health and cancer treatment. So I'm going to talk about And very briefly, what is the microbiome and why we're interested in it? And probably a lot of this will be familiar to everybody. I can't resist putting some nice figures from some scientific papers, but I will orientate you to those as we go. Um, And I think probably most importantly are point three and four, why there are limitations in the literature as it stands and what I currently say to patients when I'm asked day-to-day in practice. So what is the microbiome? Our bugs, our body, sorry, our bodies are host to absolutely trillions of bacteria. These live in our mouth, up our nose, on our skin and in our gut. And they're collectively referred to as the microbiome. Our microbiome develops with us from birth over a lifetime and each of us have our own unique microbiome. The largest numbers of our bugs are in our gut and that's largely what I'm going to be talking about today. There is an ongoing relationship between our gut bugs and our immune system, and that is essential to our health and wellness. And that determines also whether we're in disease or states of unhealth. Disruption of our gut bugs is associated with the development of cancers, and basically every human disease you can think of has been linked with a disrupted gut microbiome. But what's really important is are these microbiome disruptions the cause or contributing to the cause of our cancer or disease, or are they a consequence of the disease? And that's really the question that needs to be answered before we can ever realise the true potential that the microbiome represents as a new way to treat patients. So why are we interested? And so this is one of the figures that I mentioned one of, from one of my favourite papers. What do we know about the microbiome so far in disease? Well, we know that the microbiome of people who are healthy is very different from patients with cancer and every other disease. In patients with cancer, they have a less diverse microbiome compared to healthy adults, although remembering that is this the consequence or is this uh, the result thereof? And what this graph represents is five cohorts of patients, each one represented by a box, and every one of those little dots represents a stool sample from somebody in that cohort. The first two cohorts on the left are healthy patients, poo samples, And the four on the right are from different cancer cohorts at cancer centres around the world, two from America, one from Germany and one from Japan. We measure diversity using a a metric called alpha diversity, which just really tells us how evenly the bugs are distributed in that poo sample. And when you go up a number, that suggests there's a better or greater diversity. So you can hopefully appreciate that these two boxes on the left-hand side from our healthy patients have a higher midline through the middle, which represents a higher diversity. We also know that the microbiome changes when we measure it from patients undergoing cancer treatment and that when we have changes in the microbiome during our cancer treatment, these seem to correlate with the the chance of outcomes that matter to patients. So whether they're likely to experience complications, including infection or uh, toxicity from some of our therapies, how they respond to treatment and overall survival. So some of these microbiome features you know, really suggest that they can help us predict things that matter down the line. And again, this is a graph that shows every one of those dots represents a poo sample. So this is probably one of the largest microbiome studies done in stem cell transplant patients. And that the day of transplant therapy is on the bottom line and the diversity, as I, met, as I mentioned, with a higher number being better over the course of treatment, which shows over time, each one of those colored lines shows that there is a drop in the diversity as the transplant journey goes on. We also know that there's growing evidence to suggest that when we intervene and try and target the microbiome with therapies, that 
it's associated with good outcomes in cancer patients. So if you ever look at the scientific literature, it's easy to do. You just Google it. You'll come up with a study like this one that just says, you know, this patient receiving the volumab or an ipilimumab, so cancer treatments, um, if we give them live bacterial supplementation, we can demonstrate improved survival. It's also readily available in the lay media and our, as our consumers or our patients and families, this is readily accessible also. So not only is the medical field increasingly literate about what the microbiome may represent, we know that our patients and our families are also able to access this digestible information and that you're asking us for things that you can do to help improve your gut health. So we have to be able to have, I guess, productive conversations and digest this literature and translate it into the clinic. But what are the limitations in microbiome studies? And I think this is hopefully one of the most significant points I'd like you to be able to take away today, that while there are lots of studies that suggest a link between the microbiome and cancer, there are very few studies that link an unhealthy microbiome to a clear path where you intervene and target the microbiome with a new treatment and demonstrate an improved outcome. So we really need to not just be looking for, you know, a group of cancer patients compared to healthy adults and show that they're different. We need to be able to demonstrate that that microbiome contributes to the cause of disease. When I target it, patients have better outcomes. So we need to show that, as I've just mentioned, an unhealthy microbiome causes a certain disease or cancer that we can safely, durably and meaningfully manipulate it through either a poo transplant or a probiotic to change the microbiome. And that change in the microbiome leads to an improvement in a health outcome. So study methods matter a lot in the microbiome sphere. And I'm not going to belabor this too much, but the interstudy variability and the way we conduct these microbiome studies can contribute so much to the things that we observe. They can sometimes overpower the thing we're trying to find, which is differences in poo samples between patients. And I've just mentioned some of the, the major factors that contribute to the results that we may see, which is how we collect a sample from a patient and store it. There can be loss of bacteria, which are you know, quite fastidious and require certain environments to live in our gut. They can disappear when we put them in a tube. Where you get your poo sample from to look at the microbiome, the poo that you pass in the toilet is not the same that we get when we do a colonoscopy and get it from higher up in your bowel, so things like that. So what do I think we can realistically say about the microbiome now when you have questions for us as uh, clinicians about a healthy gut? Look, and I will preface this by saying none of this is particularly sexy and may not be what you want to hear, um, but it's all familiar stuff. And this is a, a screenshot from um, the Cancer Council of Victoria saying things that actually are not to do with the microbiome but are also very relevant. The good sleep is important. Smoking cessation is important. Exercise more. Eat a healthier diet. And obviously the tone of uh, the presentation today is about judicious use of antibiotics, you know, being clear about when antibiotics are or are not indicated is important. All of these things are better in combination than as a standalone. So it's about really a healthy lifestyle. So there's no real silver bullet for a healthy microbiome. It's all the stuff that's sort of familiar. So what do we know about sleep? Well, we know sleep is absolutely essential for health. And aside from the microbiome, we are recommended to have seven to nine hours per day Short sleep duration is associated with poor health outcomes and actually has been demonstrated in some studies to increase the risk of cancer. What do we know about the microbiome and sleep quality? Well, we do know quite a bit that the more time you spend in bed and your total sleep time is associated with a healthier microbiome and the more wake times you have um, and the early waking, you have a less favorable gut microbiome. So that checks out. And our sleeping habits matter. So if we uh, undertake a study in a group of adults, um, ask them to go to bed at nine o'clock every day and then ask them to change the habit and go to bed at 1 a.m. for a night, we will the next day see a change in their microbiome. So sleep regularly matters. The good news is that when you go back to a regular sleeping pattern, you have restoration of those healthy features. So it's, it's really an ongoing battle to make sure you have good sleep. Smoking, I mean, we don't need to um, mention in a cancer hospital that smoking cessation is a, a good intervention, but smoking is actually also a major risk factor for various gut diseases. We know it's associated with peptic ulcers and some inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's disease. When we look at the gut microbiome of adults who smoke versus those who don't, 
there are significant differences in the population and the composition of bugs. And when we test the microbiome before smoking cessation and after, afterwards we show demonstration of recovery of healthy, favourable bugs. So perhaps that's another reason to encourage or uh, justify smoking cessation um, to those around you. Exercise is good for us. Sometimes we don't want to, I don't always, always want to hear that, um, but it is. And the gut microbiome is also influenced by how much we exercise. So in, there's numerous studies looking at this, like really interesting ones. But one of my favorite is they took the Irish rugby team, so obviously elite athletes, and compared the gut microbiome to a similarly matched age cohort of healthy men and demonstrated that although the, the microbiome in healthy adults was good, it was even better when you looked in elite athletes, not to say that you need to go out and start playing rugby. Um, and that the more you exercise, the better your gut microbiome looks. So, so definitely keep it up. You can, with the introduction of exercise, induce favorable findings in your gut microbiome. It's the effect that you see is probably best in those who are overweight and don't exercise much at baseline, but we probably all have gains to make. But uh, like the sleep, it does require maintenance. So you can't exercise for a week, see a good change and expect that to persist. And it works much better when it's combined with a dietary intervention. So what can we say about diet? Well, obviously the food that we eat is what we're directly putting in contact with our gut bugs and is critically important to our gut health and composition of our bugs. There's two really nice studies, which I'm just going to run you through. The first is the PREDICT-1 study where they looked at 1,000 adults and did very detailed dietary histories and correlated those features with features in the gut microbiome. And they demonstrated that those patients uh, with a, a lower BMI and who had greater cardiovascular fitness had a more diverse so a more favourable or healthy gut microbiome. Those patients that ate healthy animal and plant-based foods, so good foods, um, compared to those that ate unhealthy plants and animal foods also was associated with uh, more favourable features. In an even larger study in the American Gut Project where they looked at over 10,000 adults, they demonstrated that the more plants you consume is actually more important than whether you class yourself traditionally as a vegan or an omnivore, et cetera, um, and that healthy bugs increased with increased diversity of plant consumption. So the, the take home of that message, I think, is eat broadly and from a variety of food groups is the best way forward. And that even um, actually also in this group, that plant consumption and diverse plant consumption was associated with less antimicrobial resistance genes in the gut microbiome. The elephant in the room is really probiotics. And, uh, and probiotics are foods or supplements that contain live bacteria, and they're widely promoted to uh, promote uh, gut health. These probiotics include fermented foods, so kefir, um, pickled vegetables, yogurt with live cultures, et cetera. But there's really limited, despite what is presented to us um, in the lay media, there's really limited evidence to demonstrate a link between probiotics and better health outcomes. I never say never to patients because um, often people are quite wed to taking their probiotics, but it's more about understanding the limitations of the product and you know, really being clear about what you're spending your money on. There are several clinical trials, and one of which I demonstrated earlier, that has pre have presented you know, what I would call tantalising results to suggest a link or an ability to influence outcomes in cancer care with the introduction of a probiotic. Um, and I think the important take-home message here is that the probiotics used in a study are randomising a really rigorous scientific study are different to the ones that you will get off the shelf at Woolworths or a chemist warehouse. In Australia, the um, Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods has over 500 probiotics registered. So there's, you know, countless numbers that you can choose from. And the TGA regulates probiotics as a complementary medicine, not as a, a medicine per se. So there's really no guarantee that what is on the label is in fact what is in the bottle. And there's no regulations that mandate that. And this is the same issue globally across the USA and Europe. So I think the take-home message is, the evidence is likely to evolve and there's a very strong signal that probiotics may be useful to us, but there's a disconnect of what you read perhaps online or see written in the published scientific literature and what you are able to institute at home when you go to your local chemist um, or supermarket. So in summary, I think the microbiome is a really exciting opportunity for us to provide better diagnostic and treatment for our cancer patients. 
However, there are uh, significant challenges with the microbiome science as it currently exists. So we have to exercise caution when we're presented with, you know, really amazing, almost too good to be true results. I think it's really essential that we have productive conversations. So between the care team, patients and their families to highlight some of these points. And that unfortunately, it's the really unsexy things like long-term diet, good exercise plans and sleep that are probably going to make the difference. Um, but I think if I was giving this talk in five or maybe 10 years from now, the things that I would be saying uh, will be different. So I think watch this space. Thank you. Thanks so much, Olivia. Um, so now um, for the last little bit of time, we'd, we'll get some chairs set up. We'll invite all our speakers um, to the front, including well, um, both our clinicians and our patients and consumers, so Nathan and Steph. Um, and while we're doing that, um, Kaz, we've got a photo of Steph's arm to chuck up on the screen. So, so um, this is really for you now. Um, no question is too stupid. We've got these fantastic people up here to answer your very dumb questions or your very clever questions or whatever you want to know. Um, and I, I love hearing about the microbiome, actually. And one of the consumer forums we did have was, was actually for Peter Mac, and we had a, a room full, a full room of, of very interested um, patients, actually, who wanted to hear about it. And um, we are using poo transplants already, aren't we? So do you want to tell everyone how we're doing it and, and the potential for the crapsule? <laughs> Thank you, Kaz. Yes, you're right. We, we do currently have an established pathway for a microbiome therapy, and it's really established for one condition. That's actually an infectious disease called Clostridium difficile colitis. So it's an infectious diarrhoea that really develops when the normal healthy microbiome has been disrupted and there's overgrowth of this pathogenic or unhealthy bug called C. diff. And the, the treatment or, or sort of the, the, the way at the end stage we've lost all our other options for treatment, we will sometimes offer a fecal transplant, which is basically just repopulating and replenishing a healthy population in the gut. Traditionally, it's been relatively unpleasant in that you obviously have to have a donor, so someone to provide a stool sample, and we've traditionally called on household family members um, for, for, for the donor stool, so you have to um, find someone you live with, get them to provide a poo sample and it was traditionally the infectious diseases trainee's job to prepare it and then administer it usually via colonoscopy to the recipient but the horizon is looking bright for fecal transplant in that we are able to reconstitute some of these bugs in the form of a capsule or, or called a crapsule um, that will hopefully be available in Australia sometime in the next 18 months. So put your hand up if you have an allergy actually. Put your hand up if you think you have an allergy. Well, I don't think I have one. I like, yeah, I'm the same issue as everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so after what you saw today, put your hand. Those of you, put your hand up if you do think you're going to go and find out if it's true or not. Well, that was going to be my question then. Yeah. Um, but maybe can I put that to Elise because Jason stepped out. How do we go about? I'll I'll bring the mic to Elise, but. I would like to get delabeled. I'm very certain my childhood rash is not a true allergy. What would be the steps for me to get rid of this allergy off my medical record? Thanks, Connie. Um, two ways. One, if you happen to be in a hospital that has an opportunistic delabeling program, so there's a number of hospitals across Victoria that um, will open like similar to what happened to Nathan, opportunistically you come in, you're being treated for another condition, and we notice that you've got an allergy label, we do an assessment and a risk stratification and can delabel you um, whilst you're in the inpatient setting. But if that's obviously an unplanned um, process. Otherwise, you can see your GP and they can refer you into um, some of the allergy testing clinics across Victorian hospitals. The Austin is a big one, but there's a number of other health services that offer an outpatient allergy testing program. And it's something that's developing. So the Austin started off with sort of one afternoon of a clinic, but um, there's quite a high, high demand for these clinics. And we've now been able to increase our resourcing and have risk sort of low, moderate and high risk clinics. So there's more clinics across the week. There's more hospitals that are implementing this service as well. So seeing the GP and getting that referral into your local public hospital um, is the best way. Elise, do you want to talk about 
Um, Jason, and, and what, what he didn't talk about today, there's some, he's been doing amazing work, actually, and he's been running trials that are international, um, and he's developed up a, a rule called the PenFast rule, which is also developed into an app. So we're hoping that once we scale that out to GPs, they will be able to do that same scoring test so that they can de-label you in the clinic. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yep. So um, at the moment, the app in its form at the moment, we're using it in the inpatient setting in a, a number of hospitals across Australia as well as internationally. So this enables clinicians, particularly those that haven't particularly done allergy or immunology training, but you might be, they might be an infectious diseases doctor or a pharmacist or a nurse or a nurse practitioner like Bell, and they can perform a, a risk assessment for penicillin allergy at the bedside with the patient. So a series of questions, very similar to what you saw Jason do today. And what he was doing was tallying up for Steph a, a risk assessment and working out your risk of having a positive test if we were to do a challenge for you. So this assists clinicians that um, may not necessarily be trained, but offers them the tools to be able to do this um, and offer it to patients so that we can um, help more patients be delabeled. Um, at the moment, as I said, it's in the inpatient setting only, but in the sort of next 12 to 18 months, we hope to be able to scale and spread this potentially to certain community programs, starting small with some select GP clinics um, and demonstrate that putting this tool and this app with obviously clinician training um, to make autonomous, autonomous decisions can help to delabel patients who are healthy in the community, not necessarily in hospital, but we can try and catch people opportunistically before they actually need antibiotics or have a requirement for them. Well, you're a nurse. Nurses are the biggest population in hospitals, actually. There's lots more nurses than doctors. What are the role of nurses in helping our patients understand their antibiotics? Thanks, Kaz. Um, I think one of the, the first things that um, nurses do is we typically put the red band on the patients. So being able to ask those questions and, and understand how to do those allergy assessments so that we can really sort of start talking and normalising it to patients um, about how, um, how the, so many allergies are, are no longer there um, and can be assessed and challenged and that it is very safe to, to have these procedures done. Um, I think that's one big thing for nurses. The other thing is we're at the bedside. When patients do have an infection, we are the ones that are collecting the samples for potential, um, trying to determine what the potential infection is. And so making sure we're doing that properly and safely is really, really important. And also empowering the patients to ask the questions about their antibiotics, why are they on antibiotics and how long do I need to be on them for? Also empowering um, family members as well um, because often so many patients will come to us and say that they didn't realise how sick they felt when they were really unwell and a few days later when they've started to recover, the, the family member was like, oh, I knew that they were terrible and I was trying to get them in for a couple of days. Um, and so making sure that, that the family members as well understand um, the potential signs and symptoms of serious infections. <clears throat> Interrupt any time. I am going to hold that line a little bit about the serious infection because the flip side what we haven't talked today is about sepsis. So September is usually sepsis awareness. And sepsis is the body's reaction to a serious infection and you can die. It's serious. It needs to be treated. Kidneys can shut down. Um, um, often end up in ICU. And this is, the, this is part of the reason that doctors are so fearful of undertreating. But we have seen terrible examples, haven't we, like the young girl in Perth who 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 died of sepsis while sitting in a hospital waiting room. So, Gab, this sepsis question, I'm going to put you on the spot here, is a really difficult one for kids because kids often can't express that, you know, they've been having rigors at home or, you know, they've got severe pain, back pain. How, how do you, how do you work with families when babies are brought in or kids brought in and you have to decide whether it's a virus or bacteria or what do you do? You're right. It can be very, very difficult, even for clinicians that have worked in the field for many, many years. 
We have a very low threshold in very young children, so infants under three months of age, to assume the worst in those and treat for a serious bacterial infection. And I think what that means is that we're over-treating a lot of young babies, but um, they can get so unwell so quickly. We don't have time to wait. As they get older, it starts to get easier. And there are, I mean, similar to how we would manage adult patients, there are different parameters of their heart rate and blood pressure and how they're looking to help us differentiate more unwell um, children from ones that perhaps, uh, you know, just have a, a viral infection but still looking a bit um, average. One of the things, though, I always teach um, the team I work with is to just really listen to what the parents and the carers are worried about, I think, and particularly kids that might have been gone to the GP for, you know, on Monday and back on Wednesday and now are in the emergency department on Friday. That type of stuff would always ring alarm bells to me that, you know, they've been worried about this child so many times that they've sought medical advice um, numerous times. And I think just taking that parental concern into part of your assessment is really important as well. Steph. You've got a kid. What are the things, when when have you been really worried about Lottie? You know, when, when have you really thought, gee, I need to take her to go and see someone? As, as a parent, what are the things that would worry you the most? <laughs> well, probably the first time it happened was um, she was probably four or five months old Um I stepped into the bathroom for 30 seconds and came back and she was face down on the floor and grey. Um, we were living near Box Hill Hospital, so I literally <laughs> ran with the pram to the hospital and Jerome met me there and she was just white as a sheet. They took her vitals. It didn't look too bad and then she persisted with a projectile vomit that probably went about three metres. Um, so that was one. But another incident, I was... <laughs> um, another time, Cap it was knows actually all, all of that, that, right? You, Jerome, Gab's, Gab's husband's actually a paramedic, so the same oh, thing happened to her. Oh, so really? she'd say, "Dan, Dan, bring the ambulance." Sorry, Steph. Keep That's going. Right. <laughs> um, the second one was actually I was at the ballet with Mum and Jerome. Actually, Lottie was with my dad, and she developed a high fever. Um, Jerome managed to pick her up at some point uh, later in the evening, but before we'd left the ballet, um, she had a really high fever and he ended up taking her to the Austin and asked for an um, a X-ray because she, uh, he was worried she might have had pneumonia um, and she just had a really, really, really bad virus, which I ended up getting about four days later. <laughs> So that, I guess that's a good point because a, a virus can look exactly like a severe bacterial infection and I guess um, that just made me think of the need for better diagnostics. So we still rely on some of our older traditional ways of diagnosing a severe bacterial infection and I think when we can get more rapid at the bedside ways to differentiate between bacterial and viral infections, we might be able to um, use antibiotics more appropriately. Nathan, so you're, you know, because of all your medical history, we would classify you as someone who's probably pretty experienced with hospitals, you, your experience with how they work and what happens. Um, and you've obviously gone through this and, and, you know, have a pretty good understanding. How, how would you go about explaining to someone, someone else about this allergy thing? Do you feel like you have the knowledge now to explain to other friends and family? And, and have you been doing that? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, yes, I think I do. So um, obviously the, this session has been absolutely amazing to build on that knowledge. But um, I think my family and friends would agree that I'm pretty vocal and passionate. You're about... Dr. Nathan now. Steph's oh. <laughs> Steph. That's Dr. Steph to all our friends. Okay. You know, I think, um, I think um, I've been quite vocal to people that if you've got this type of allergy, then um, you should have the opportunity to actually have it re-diagnosed or just, you know, to make sure that you've got access to um, a wide range of medical treatment versus what, you know, locking it down to options that may not be the best options out there. 
free. What do you do with how do how do um how do vets diagnose allergies in pets? The same rashes and like you know. Yeah, how would you... a, lo a lot of it's. I mean, I was just speaking to someone earlier. Dogs and cats are very. All mammals are fairly fairly much the same. Uh, scheme we're, we're very similar on the inside and outside there's a few except we can eat chocolate but they can't yeah well I was going to say yes yeah, so and we we metabolize some chemicals in a, in a different way and that's that can be really important but in terms of allergies it's very similar so dogs often are allergic to pollens that are circulating in the air and they have an airborne allergen but instead of getting the hay fever symptoms they tend to have more of these skin symptoms, um, then that seems to be the more common manifestation than it is in humans. And then, yeah, they're, they're these ear infections that people don't typically think of as part of allergy, but it is driven by allergy. Um, yeah, so, so we're very similar and that is why we have a lot of the same drugs. Um, my question to you then is if they're presenting with a skin rash, is there then a drive from patients expecting that to be fixed with antibiotics as well and then it's just a endless cycle yeah yeah there, there is there is a lot of expectation uh, of receiving i think a lot of the time when we present to a vet or to a doctor we expect to walk out with something whether that's a a drug or some instructions of what to do um it is difficult to walk out with nothing and to have people say, well, there's nothing I can do. You know, you just have to go home and get over this virus by yourself. Um, I think it's really, really powerful to give people things like nursing instructions, things they can do to at least improve comfort. If you can't do anything else except wait for the immune system to do what it's there for, I think providing comfort and addressing those symptoms is, is the best thing that we can do. And I you know, I'm always telling vets to make sure you address that, you know, pain relief, just give pain relief if there's pain. Um, and then you can check in with the, with the pet owner in a couple of days and say, is, is this now resolving? If not, let's have another look. Let's have another think about it. Um, yeah. Mark, what sort of language should we be using when we talk about these things? It's, it's a big problem, isn't it? Because we've talked about some pretty medical concepts, haven't we, today? You know, th words that you probably wouldn't have heard before. You know, you saw some pretty horrible pictures up there. Um, we don't do a very good job. And there's been lots of evidence around saying not, not using things like superbug because, well, what does that mean? Um, so how should we be talking about it? Well, I agree with what you've just said, and you, you said that at the very beginning, this kind of uh, militaristic word in a war against superbugs is counterproductive in the sense that it's not actually true because some bugs we need. The microbiome shows us that. And uh, when we have a war, there are all sorts of, you know, the kind of violence metaphor is problematic it's hard to communicate about it alienates some people helps people turn make some people turn away from the messaging so i think it's about practical things that actually help people in the particular situations they're in and giving practitioners more tools to be able to do that as effectively as possible uh, i could you know I, there are lots of things we could do, but I think it's really about that relationship. I mean, I think where I'm coming to in my research is the kind of clinician-patient relationship is where the action is and how we, you know, scaffold, narrate, support, helpful kind of uh, conversations about these issues. The more we can kind of skill up practitioners uh, around social awareness, cultural awareness, the better we will be. Very well put. Now, I think we've got a question at the back of the room. Yeah. Question? Yeah. It's basically the same question Cass asked earlier. I just want to make it, um, I just want to be clear about it. So if I were to give my pet antibiotics, and the developed reaction, how do I know that now my pet is allergic to this antibiotic? Um, 
the good news is we don't actually see antibiotic allergies much in pets. Um, I have never seen a, of the type that we're talking about here, I've never seen it. Uh, they do, they do exist, but they're vanishingly rare. Uh, so I would say you don't, generally speaking, pet owners do not need to worry about this. It's, it's a, it's a very, un, very unusual outcome. And your vet would probably be quite excited to hear that your animal has had a reaction. They, they definitely get all those things that Jason was saying are not real, that they're, they're more adverse effects, things like diarrhea, not wanting to eat, all that stuff. That is very common. Um, but those other types of allergies, quite unusual. Um, yeah, they're, they're actually the one that, uh, actually, I can't remember which drug were you, Steph, were you allergic to? Bactrim. Okay. Um, yeah, so there is, yeah. B Bactrim's trimethoprim? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So actually, Bact Bactrim is, uh, is one of the ones that we sometimes, you know, rarely see a reaction to. Um, and that can, you know, can it can actually cause hepatitis, it can cause thyroid problems, it can cause some skin eruptions, but only if you use it for quite a long period. So I would say don't worry about it too much. Um, it's, it's most unusual. Okay, and then a question. Yeah, just a question from a non-clinician born out of at the moment. In the face, when faced with increasing amounts of um, anti um, antibiotic resistance, if you your partner, multi-drug resistance, are there any other alternative um, therapies being thought of? Like, for, for instance, bacteriophage therapies, is there any hope for that um, at all in the clinical studies using yes, bacteriophages? Yes. Yep, bacteriophages are on their way. There's, these are like a virus that kill bacteria. They're like tiny little they pierce the bacteria and kill them almost instantaneously. So there's studies where they patients have had golden staph infections and they've popped, popped the bacteriophage on and like it's like a something out of a sci-fi movie. It just sort of yeah. It's an area of active interest. In yeah. fact, Monash have a big centre and there's some in New South Wales. I I I think they're starting to be offered. We see we have email groups where you know, someone from Sydney always says, oh, yeah, give them bacteriophages, but I've, I've not used them yet, but they're coming. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It, it is interesting, um, you know, it's not just bacteria in our microbiome, is there? What else is in? You're right. It's a complex ecosystem, and we think we focus, or the literature is focused largely on the bacteria. But there's parasites, there's viruses. You know, it's a complex community, and we're just sort of starting to uncover what the viruses in our healthy microbiome may represent, and how they may change when you say have a viral infection, or when you're unwell if there's an imbalance in the viral population. It's also fungi as part of your microbiome as well, and we obviously know you can have infections from fungi, but they're also part of your normal healthy flora so trying to understand that is is part of the future as well i'll just add as well about the phages i guess the other parties um yes they exist and similar to like the drugs it's how do you deliver that medication so there's yeah there's like there is work developing in that but yet still working out what is the most effective way for it to su survive in the bloodstream and get to the point of infection so yeah this question is for Olivia. I'm not really sure. Microbiome is the same as in as normal flora, or if you just touched on it a little bit now. Would you mind clarifying that for me, please? Yeah, sure. So we are absolutely colonized with trillions of microorganisms that make up our microbiome, and we have a healthy microbiome that develops with us from birth and evolves over a lifetime. That microbiome is found you know, all over our skin, from our head, up our nose, down our throats, in our guts, which is part of our normal flora, which we, would, we sort of colloquially refer to as our flora, um, but the, it's an interchangeable term. But yes, we have a healthy microbiome, which we would not be able to live without. Yep, oh. Oh, so we wrap up some of the um, gut microbiome. Uh, can we like sort of like redevelop this over time? 
Hundred percent. So the way we interact with our environment is that we're constantly exposed to bacteria, whether it's the you know our own populations on our skin, on our pets, our family members, and you know the way we eat. Um, we're constantly exposed to populations of microorganisms that will be replenishing and and interacting with our microbiome. After you've had chemotherapy or other cancer treatments uh, or even antibiotic exposures, there is a temporary disruption to that healthy population and it takes a period of time for it to recover. The thought is after a single course of antibiotics that takes some months, um, but in I guess if you're having cancer treatment that continues over months to years, there may be long-standing disruption. I think understanding exactly how the populations change over time, what we should be endeavouring to recover to is, you know, a really important uh, question that needs to be answered by the literature before we can say one probiotic or one fecal transplant fits all. And uh, probably lucky last before we talk about the reactions. Thank you. Um, I have maybe two questions. Yeah. yeah. So one is uh, with regards to the antibiotics. Um, I think I spoke to Yes, about um, a, a condition where someone would be given antibiotics continuously, uh, but uh, the infection or whatever is, causing, is not going away, they can be given maybe two, three uh, kinds of antibiotics uh, for a long time, but the condition is not going away. Uh, what would be the implications of continuing taking those antibiotics? And yet the problem is, is not being fixed. Um, we, I know we talked about uh, infectious diseases, but if the condition is not kind of infectious, I don't know what else. So I, I can, the, the, the example is hydradenata suppurativa, yeah. which is a terribly, um, it's a terrible infection of the sweat glands and it actually is really difficult to treat and yeah. patients can have horrible boils um, and having months and years of doxycycline. And what do we do in that situation in a teenager? Difficult. It is a difficult question. It is a difficult question. It's a little bit like treating acne for a long time. And um, Steph, you could probably talk about Steph. Steph actually had cystic acne, terrible cystic acne. And what did you end up having to do? Well, prior to that, I was on my Steklin B for about two years as a teenager. That was before I got the cystic. What is it? It's the same as it's the same class as doctor. So that was not for cystic acne. Yeah. The cystic acne was treated with the contraceptive pill and changing my hormonal oh. um, balance. I think, I think part of what we talked about, if you're in a situation when you're a cycle, you've been continually prescribed a current course of antibiotics and whatever the condition is is not being resolved, mm. you, what's the next step? And you may need to get to some specialist help to sort it out. And that's absolutely fine because some things we don't have an answer for mm. and there might be some underlying immune reason why you're getting recurrent boils. They need to be investigated. So I, we would typically say, not that we want extra work, but, you know, maybe getting to an infectious disease specialist to go through the steps. We see many patients with current boils, recurrent boils, actually, and um, it's a tricky issue. And we have various things that we do around decolonising and, and trying to manage, manage the um, household environment and, um, you know, using various washes, sometimes some um, antibiotics up the nose. There are lots of things that can be done. You just need to get to the right practice. Right. Oh, and, and another yeah, sorry, another question is to do with the uh, bio the microbiome. No, microbiomes. Yeah, Are they the called gut. the gut? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, um, I don't know whether it's at the moment the uh, treatment is more um, for people with uh, conditions like cancer or any other gut issues. Um, for example, for myself, I have to eat what uh, they call a low food diet because um, my gut is not 
right? I've had uh, colonoscopy, I've had uh, gastroscopy, and no, no disease found per se. So would things like the microbiomes kind of work in those situations or? Great question. I think you're sort of hitting the nail on the head of where we might be in five to 10 years when we understand more. I think the science has uh, demonstrated that there are one or two instances where we can, as I mentioned, demonstrate that a microbiome disruption leads to a disease. We can meaningfully and durably intervene to manipulate the gut bugs, and then that leads to improved outcomes. But there's only a handful of instances where that's been demonstrated. Um, I think it also speaks to the fact that there's no such thing as a, a single healthy microbiome, that your microbiome being optimal is different to my optimal gut microbiome. So it's not as easy to just apply one treatment for everybody. And that's where the science, I think, has a lot to answer for before we can bring this into real time. Uh, it may well be in 10 years' time, you will have a resolution of symptoms from a microbiome treatment, but it's a way off. Yeah. All right. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, I think we've hit, hit we've hit seven o'clock, and it's nothing like finish talking about poo to finish a meeting. Um, and I think it's all given us a lot to think about, Liv. Every time I hear you talk about it, um, I'd like to thank um, all the panel and speakers today. Thank you so much for your generosity in coming to help us um, educate these people. So thank you. Round of applause. I'd especially like to thank my team and Courtney and Zohal and Kaz and Nicole and where are you? Rachel, where's Rachel? Fantastic, Rachel, Ron, Rod, Leslie, the team who have helped pull, pull this together today. Um, before we finish off, this is Steph Sam, and you can see... On number one, there's that little red welt. What's it feeling like now, Steph? It's almost gone. So that's the histamine, which is a little bit like having an actual mozzie bite, but you could you could get the gist. But we'll um we'll we've videoed it and we'll put it up on the website and then you can show your um friends and family. Thank you so much, Steph, for your generosity in doing that and also Nathan and telling your story. So I think we might um finish up tonight. Thank you, everyone. I think it's been a really fantastic session and I hope you, each of you have taken something away that you didn't know and that you can pass on. Thank you. Thank you.